All right, guys, welcome back to another video lecture. This is uh, essentially part two of proteins um, in terms of uh, gene expression and um, taking those mRNAs and sort of making the proteins. Now, we talked a lot um, in the last video about a lot of the details, so this time uh, we're just going to hit the highlights, the things that we didn't talk about. So um, we didn't talk about the central dogma. Now, the central dogma is a sort of the, the, the main idea or the main belief um, for a long time that uh, DNA was the source of all genetic information, that DNA was made into RNA and that RNA ultimately made proteins. Now, we do know that DNA can make its own DNA, and we know also that RNA can catalyze the formation of, of other RNAs, but what we also just sort of recently discovered with uh, retroviruses is that some organisms only have RNA. And RNA can be made into DNA, which can then be made into RNA and into protein. So um, the central dogma, though it used to say that DNA was the start, the source of all genetic information, RNA has been shown to also uh, sort of play into that. So this sort of paints the, the, the real picture. DNA and RNA are interconvertible with each other. They can both replicate themselves. Uh, and ultimately, RNA gets made into protein. Transcription we talked about is that process by which the DNA gets made into mRNA. Uh, and we mentioned that there was polymerases. Let's look at the details of those. So there's um, essentially three types of polymerase. Uh, sorry, this is the picture that we, this is a different picture, but sort of what we looked at last time. There's the replication fork. There's some unwinding that happens. Um, actually, we looked at... Um, DNA replication. So this is a little bit different, right? The, the RNA polymerase this time instead of DNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is running along the DNA. Now notice that the DNA that's being copied is actually the three prime to five prime direction. Now you might be wondering why that is. Well, because the information that codes for the protein is on the five prime to three prime side, like these three nucleotides here and these three nucleotides and these three nucleotides specify certain proteins. If we were to take these three nucleotides, the complement, that wouldn't be the same thing. And so we need our mRNA to look just like our strand of five prime to three prime. So we have to copy the other strand, what we'll call the template strand. Uh, we'll refer to the coding strand as the one that carries the information. And again, the mRNA looks a lot like the coding strand. Um, there's going to be a termination site that we'll investigate a little bit um, in the DNA. How does the RNA polymerase know when the gene stops and where to stop? Um, you know, and there's a, there's essentially um, a, a series of amino uh, of, of nucleotides that gets coded in right there that leads to structures in the mRNA. Um, certain structures in the mRNA called hairpin loops. Uh, I can't spell, hairpin loops form and cause the RNA polymerase to kind of fall off of the DNA. Um, there's some polymerases that are important. Um, RNA polymerase 1 is essentially responsible for, for prepping all of the ribosomes in your cells. Um, pol 2 is what makes mRNA, and polymerase 3 is what gets all the tRNAs formed. Oh, sorry, as well as one of the ribosomal subunits. And this is a uh, RNA polymerase 2 from yeast. So this is more like um, ours would look like. Here you can see the DNA is sort of inside there, um, and the mRNA is being copied and, and sort of extruded into the uh, extracellular or extra ribosome, uh, extra uh, polymerase environment outside the polymerase. So as far as transcription goes, we talked about what genes were um, and how our um, genes are separated by some non-coding regions. Um, so let's talk about a little of those. Now, structural genes make proteins. Um, these have introns that need to be cut out. And regulatory genes are often um, in front of those structural genes. And whether or not these um, have the right conditions met, um, the structural gene will or won't get um, transcribed. And we call those promoters. And the promoter region is where the DNA and or RNA polymerases will bind. 
Um, if we want a gene to be made, we need to get RNA polymerase or DNA polymerase. Uh, sorry, when we want to make a protein, it's RNA polymerase that we want. We need to get it, you know, to get right in front of our structural gene and actually copy that, and make mRNAs out of it. So the promoter helps to do that. Um, there are transcription factors um, that are involved, other proteins that have to be present. Um, we'll look a little bit about how this gets regulated. There are proteins that'll um, uh, increase the amount of transcription. There are inhibitors that'll decrease the amount of transcription. Um, there's also some other parts of the promoter sequence that we can talk about. Um, consensus sequences are those um, where the, we see a lot of repeats of two nucleotides. And one of those is the Tata box. And I think we have a diagram of it here. Um, now the Tata box um, is about 26 pairs upstream. And it is involved with a lot of the binding of the transcription factors. Let's jump in ahead and see it. And we'll jump back. So this is the gene, the structural gene. It has exons and introns. Um, the regulatory gene is right here, and it's got a promoter region with an initiator spot. This is where the mRNA uh, or the polymerase would, would bind. The Tata region here is going to be, again, um, another place where um, our, our enzymes uh, and our proteins will bind to help um, signal the start of transcription. Um, it should be known that or noticed that the TA, TA is the weak bonds. Remember, GC is a lot harder to break. And so um, this is going to help getting these two strands of DNA apart from each other for copying or making mRNA. So they interact, uh, the Tata box interacts with our transcription factors, which are proteins. Um, once initiation starts, and there's a few initiation factors, uh, proteins that have to be there, process um, starts elongation, where it essentially moves down the DNA um, and copies um, mRNA. And so that's the elongation step. So initiation, then elongation, and then there's termination. And again, there will be certain sequences that will come across um, that'll lead to everything dissociating from itself. Now, um, all mRNAs, uh, I'm sorry, all RNAs that get made from transcription um, need to be modified. Not all of them are, are ready to, to, to go right off out the gate. And so we'll talk about post-transcription modifications. Um, I mentioned the mRNA in the last video that we needed to adjust the five prime and three prime sides of those. Uh, tRNA as well gets trimmed, capped, and methylated before it's ready to um, accept an amino acid. And RNAs need some kind of um, post-transcriptional methylation. They get CH3 groups added to them. And so here we can see that modification to the mRNA. Um, we're going to get some splicing out of our introns and then our ready mRNA here. All right. Uh, we talked a little bit about translation um, in the last video. We know mRNA is the information, rRNA is the ribosome where it all takes place, and tRNAs bring in the amino acids. So um, we can look a little bit more uh, at the details of that. Now, um, um, little differences in the, the actual ribosomes um, in our bodies. We have a 60S ribosome in prokaryotes. Um, it's a little different. Um, so in our bodies, we have a 40S and a 60S together. I think in, in the prokaryotes, it was the 50S and the 30S. Um, so these are the two units. Now they come together and bind to the mRNA, and then the mRNA um, has those codons on it. Now codons are the genetic code. Three nucleotides that will essentially code for an amino acid. Now different amino acids are brought to this complex by the tRNAs. Each tRNA, as we mentioned in the last video, is specific for one amino acid. We have at least 20 enzymes that are specific for each of those amino acids uh, to get them onto a tRNA. Um, each enzyme recognizes only one tRNA, and they attach the amino acid through an ester bond. Um, the codon recognition site is where um, the anticodon is, and the anticodon is going to pair up or complementary pair with the codon on the mRNA. So let's take a uh, look at an example. So here's just that L structure again of the tRNAs, anticodon loop down at the bottom. Now, we have figured out what the genetic code is by experiment. 
using synthetic mRNAs that have like only U's, right? U, 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 the entire way. And we eventually figured out that every three codes for phenylalanine because we get a whole bunch of phenylalanines linked together. together. And they could do this for A, 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 and G, 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 and so on. And that gives them, you know, four of those amino acids that the, that the codes for. Then by alternating it, A, C, A, C, A, C, we end up with alternating A, C, A, and C, A, C, and then A, C, A, and C, A, C. That would be the, the code. Well, those give uh, long chains of amino acids that, that flip, flip, back, flip back and forth between two amino acids. And so doing this and a bunch of other little experiments that vary, they were able to figure out the code. So here's the code. You can see here, three codes, uh, three letter codes that all code for either phenylalanine or leucine. Sometimes um, there's four codes that all go for the same amino acid. Um, there's quite a few families that are like that, that have four codes. So what you notice here is that often the first two nucleotides determine what it's gonna be. And then the third nucleotide um, doesn't matter. So in the case of proline here, uh, the third nucleotide could be a U, a C, an A, or a G, and we still get proline. And this is thought to have evolved as a mechanism to reduce the number of, of errors that happen. I mean, not that errors, it reduces the errors, but it just, it compensates, right? If there's an error, you still end up with the same amino acid. And so that's a good thing. Um, okay. In addition to coding for amino acids, there's one that's always the start codon. So this is what signals the beginning of a protein. Now in our bodies, this methionine usually gets cut off of that protein. And in bacteria, this is usually a modified methionine. Um, and then also there's some stop codons. These don't have tRNAs. So when the ribosome gets to these um, particular codes, there's no tRNA bringing in a new amino acid, and so the protein chain stops growing. Um, 64 codes in total. We have, um, let's see, anything on here that's worth saying? Uh, again, we've noticed that our, our genetic code is continuous. That means that there's no gaps in the middle, um, as opposed to like three letters and then like a, a gap letter and then three letters and then a gap letter. Um, it's continuous, meaning there's no gaps, and unpunctuated uh, means that there's no, again, little spaces in between. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what unpunctuated means. Continuous means that um, if I had A, 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 um, continuous means that this is one code, this is another code uncontinuous would mean, well, maybe this is another code, and then this is another code, and this is like every three from any starting point, and ours is not that way. It's continuous. Um, this is talking about um, the wobble, the wobble codon, the third position. Again, that ensures that even if there's a mistake, we get the same amino acid. And this is uh, the reason we call it universal, is because with a few exceptions like our mitochondria for some codons and, and also for some other weird organisms, um, these same codes code for the same amino acid in all organisms. Like I said, there are some differences. Um, some stop codons actually code for protein, uh, amino acids in some organisms and um, in some organisms we don't get methionine as the start codon, um, but those are rare. So translation is the next step. This happens in a couple of steps. Activation of the tRNAs, initiation of the, um, the um, ribosome, elongation, the growing peptide chain, and then termination, reaching those stop sequences. Um, let's see, activation. I mentioned this is about the tRNAs. We'll probably take a look at that right now. Initiation is gonna be recognizing the start codon. Elongation, we're gonna have um, uh, peptide bonds that are formed um, between these tRNAs and the growing chain. And then termination, we're gonna see that there are some release factors. All right, as far as activation goes, this requires some ATP energy. Um, so you see ATP is required on the amino acid to activate the amino acid. 
so that it can be added to the tRNA. Now this is the tRNA unloaded, this is the tRNA loaded. So now it has the amino acid on it. And again, this is specific for this amino acid. They are um, connected to each other by synthetase. Synthetase is the kind of proofreading mechanism in this process of translation. Synthetase has to recognize the amino acid and the tRNA before connecting them together um, to ensure that only the right tRNAs get paired up. Um, here you can see the formation of the, um, the complex. So our mRNA has something called a Schein-Delgarno sequence. This is the series of codes that um, the RNA is going to recognize so that the polymerase can actually start at the right spot, just ahead of the start codon. Um, then we have some initiation factors. Initiation factor 1 and initiation factor 3, I believe, uh, mainly hold everything together. Initiation factor 2 is responsible for um, um, bringing in this first methionine residue. And so you can see here in the ribosome, we can kind of divide it into three spots here. We've got the P zone, the A zone, and the exit site. The peptidyl site, the P zone, is where that initial amino acid is now sitting. Our next tRNA is going to come into the A site, and then we're going to have another tRNA sitting here with its own amino acid on it. And this amino acid will get transferred to the growing chain and then the ribosome will move along the RNA, the, the mRNA. Let's see if we have a picture of that. So you can kind of see what I was getting at there. Um, okay. So we've got the P site listed here. All right, now we've got elongation to worry about. So elongation requires a few elongation factors. Now the two main ones are elongation factor TU and elongation factor TS. Elongation factor TU's job um, is to help bring in these uh, amino acids. And so it helps with the binding of the tRNAs. Now this is one of the most uh, prevalent proteins in our bodies. We, have, we need this protein to do this job. Um, EFTS's job is to regenerate EFTU because it gets used up. It has a GTP um, and then it gets, you know, it loses that GTP and needs to be regenerated. So it transfers that energy in order to bind um, the next amino acid in here. We get transfer. So the amino acid is going to get moved. Um, sorry, this one gets moved to that one by peptidyl transferase. So now we have a growing chain. And then the mRNA sort of gets pulled along through a process called translation. It gets pulled through the ribosome. And now it's shifted over. So now you can see it here. The one carrying the alanine that was in the A site is now in the P site. And now there's an open A site. And what was in the P site here is now exiting from the E site. And this process will repeat over and over and over until we hit a stop codon. Now this is that reaction of the, the, the peptide bond forming. Um, so we've got that nitrogen on the N-terminus side of our amino acid kind of attacking the carbonyl side. This is called a nucleophilic attack. Termination happens when we get to the stop codon. There's no tRNAs that recognize this. So instead there are release factors, proteins that come in and actually cleave the peptide chain from the tRNA. Because remember, we've got now an mRNA has a ribosome on it that has a tRNA in it that now has this big long polypeptide chain right attached to it that's a, those are amino acids um, and so these you know now that it's at essentially the stop codon uh, no new well, I guess I, I, I guess I moved this over to the wrong spot the stop codon wouldn't actually be right there I guess I can't erase that uh, the stop codon would be, well, that's a, that's a fail. Here we go. The stop codon uh, would be right there next to it, right? Because there was already a tRNA that recognized this spot. So no new tRNAs coming in. So these release factor proteins come 
and they cleave that bond, freeing up the peptide. Sorry about the poor quality of my drawings. Now, regulation can happen at two levels. We've talked a little bit about the transcription level one. Um, this is promoters and inhibitors um, kind of using that regulatory gene, that, that promoter region, um, to either increase transcription or to decrease transcription. Now, the other type of regulation happens um, during translation, sort of on the protein or during the mRNA. So let's look at that. So um, initiators um, will recognize tata -ta boxes or other conserved sequences um, and help promote um, the associations of the RNA polymerases and all of the initiation factors so that um, uh, transcription will happen more often. Likewise, there can be a, um, a molecule that goes and binds there that actually stops uh, RNA polymerase from, from being able to locate the promoter, and those would be inhibitors. Um, and so again, we can, we can vary the amount of a protein being made through the use of transcription factors. Um, transcription factors have a few different mechanisms by which they bind to the DNA. Um, usually they talk about helix turn helix or leucine zippers as being the way um, that these interactions happen, and they're often metal, um, metal ions that are associating with um, these, these uh, amino acid residues. So we'll take a look at a few of those. Um, and I mentioned inhibitors, um, repressors is another term for the same sort of thing, something that decreases how much protein is being made. Um, these are those um, zinc finger motifs. So you see how the zinc associates with the, um, with the amino acid residues, and then it leads to these sort of secondary structures, these little loops. Uh, or helices kind of um, attached to these loops. And so then we end up with zinc fingers. Um, the fingers are these kind of little portions right here that seem to like grab onto the DNA. They fit into the major groove. That's what zinc fingers sort of looks like. Um, again, it's just a binding motif. And then leucine zippers are another one. And there's a helix turn helix, which is a third. Um, motifs we see in a lot of the proteins that bind to DNA. Um, alternate splicing, we know that this is another, um, this is a translation level um, regulation. So different types of proteins can result from different types of splicing. Um, cutting out, you know, the exons here can result in a few different genes. We can get just the green parts as a gene, or we can get this little blue part included as a separate gene. Um, the more little pieces, the more different ways that you can splice them together. And so that's sort of showing here with a few you know, several different splice sites, you can get different proteins. And some genes will actually encode for multiple proteins depending on which way they get spliced. Um, again, you can kind of see that thing here. Two other versions of this. One that kept an intron and one where we have different exons being inserted in the middle, leading to different products. Uh, as far as... Um, Regulation and control at the translation level. Um, we mentioned that those T amino um, acyl uh, enzymes, those um, uh, were the last sort of defense at making sure the right amino acid gets paired up with the right uh, tRNA. We've got uh, stop codons and we've got post translational control. And we've talked about this a little bit in terms of. Uh, meth methylation or hydroxylation or acetylation, just adding groups to your proteins, uh, to the amino acids afterward, uh, after the protein's been made and this sort of changes the function. Um, chaperoning, this is uh, where other proteins sort of um, help your finished protein to fold properly or help to keep it from finishing folding properly until we can move it to a place where we want it to do its job. That happens sometimes. And then Sometimes misfolded proteins do happen, and we have to have a system for being able to deal with that. And so we, we constantly are breaking down our proteins, um, good and bad. Some last longer than others, um, but the point is um, that's the safest way to make sure that we don't have any bad proteins around. It's just to constantly be tearing everything down and rebuilding it. So, so having multiple levels of control um, helps to, to fine-tune how much of one type of protein we have at any given time. 
mutations happen. We've talked a little bit about this um, uh, and what can cause those. Let's talk about what that means for translation. So let's say um, uh, in one example here, they're talking about how it doesn't matter which um, nucleotide we get in the last position here, A, G, C, or T, they all code for valine. And so no matter what happens, if we get, you know, um, one of those letters to change, it'll still code for valine. But if accidentally it gets changed to something else um, and the amino acid changes to something else, well, that's a big deal. Uh, amino acids are, you know, we know is very important um, for, for how they fold. Um, and so we've talked a little bit about what a mutagen is, just something that causes a mutation. Not all mutations are bad. Um, we've evolved the way that we have because of mutations. Some are actually beneficial. Um, nucleotide excision repair. We talked a little bit about base excision repair, um, but it's another mechanism for um, cutting out and fixing the damaged portions of our DNA. Recombinant DNA is something where we can actually take DNA from one organism and insert it into another. Um, this is how we've been able to make E. coli, for example, um, produce insulin for us rather than how we used to get it. Um, and the book goes through a few little images here to kind of show how that's done. I'm just going to show you um, this image here because this kind of has the best. So bacteria have little circular bits of DNA called plasmids, and these are really good to use as carriers for our genes. So what we do is we cut out a little section of the plasmid, and then we use you know the same thing that kind of cuts the plasmid apart. We use that to cut out the gene that we want to stick in. That way the ends look the same, the sticky ends as they're being referred to here. So then we insert this gene into the plasmid. Now that little bit of DNA that the bacteria is going to use um, has our inserted DNA in it. Um, and it'll start to transcribe and then translate that gene into proteins that we can then harvest. Um, gene therapy is a treatment where if somebody has a defective gene, we can try to go in there and fix that gene by putting the right information in. And the, the hard part about that is that you know, um, there's not a really good mechanism that we have to go in and change the DNA of all your cells. Fortunately, that's what viruses do. Viruses are just DNA, and often they need your, your whole body to be able to copy their DNA. And they do it by just sticking their DNA into your DNA. Um, and so what we've done is we've taken control of that process in viruses. Uh, we've been able to take um, virus uh, genes remove the bits that the virus that would make other virus parts, insert into that spot the gene that we want to fix, let's say, or that we want to express in a new organism, and then we let that virus go and do its job again. And it goes and it infects cells, and it basically inserts, well, it's not really a virus at that point, um, but we would, we, we're kind of using some of the tools the virus had in it, mainly the part that cuts out our DNA and inserts their DNA. So what we've done is, inserted the correct gene that we want. Now, in the past, some of this, uh, geez, these gene therapies have caused like cancer and stuff, but um, we're getting better at it. Um, and so you can kind of see that here too. Um, these viruses don't have the gene that they think they have inside them, and instead they go and they, they put in um, whatever we've inserted into them, into the organism's genome, leading to the proteins that they were maybe lacking. All right, so uh, that's the end of chapter 26. So you can see that it really does go really well with chapter 25. Um, these things are hand in hand. So we've looked at proteins, um, we've looked at DNA, and we've looked at how we get proteins from DNA. So know the basics, don't get caught up in the details, um, but definitely still you know, refer to your book. All right, guys, see you next time.